Uh, an overview about uh, deep learning models in the automatic speech recognition. Uh, so basically, the first part will be to explain to you uh, the, the basic pipeline that was used before and uh, the current supervised models. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about something that I did that uses less supervision. <coughs> um, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, okay, so just as this is the first meetup ever, uh, if you never did neural networks, um, I think you should uh, start with uh, logistic regression for sure, and just doing uh, logistic regression, HGD, and uh, the backpropagation algorithm. And this is covered in the, in the iPattern notebook that I put on my blog here, so you can you can access it from here if you want. Uh, and these are more uh, uh, kind of uh, more from the deep learning cuisine <laughs> that you have to learn if you want to train efficient models. Okay, so when you do speech recognition, you work on sound. Uh, actually, we don't really work on waves. Actually, um, some researchers work on waves, but not most of the uh, best models. They work on this kind of representation that is the color here. Uh, so we take the, the speech like that, which is a waveform. Uh, and we do STFT, which stands for uh, short time uh, Fourier transform. So Fourier transform with um, uh, with Hamming windows that we move. So typically we we have windows of about 25 milliseconds that we move from uh, 10 milliseconds. That's a good uh, parameter for speech, human speech. And then we do a power spectrum. We take uh, we accumulate the frequencies uh, of the frequency domain on uh, filter banks, and then we do a loop compression. So from this, what's what's more important about this is that from this you get the picture in color. Uh, so in the picture in color, here you have the frequencies, and here you have the time. Okay. <coughs> so if you want more details, also I I've also made a blog post on this, so you can read the whole detail of the uh, process, feature preprocessing that we do in speech. Okay. So the classic uh, pipeline for speech recognition is to do uh, until 2008, 2009, yeah, until 2009, it was to do HMM GMMs. So, what does it mean? It means you do a hidden Markov model. Uh, I don't maybe some of you are familiar with hidden Markov models, I guess, uh, with a Gaussian mixture model as an emission process. So, what does it say? It says that you do a, you have a Markov chain uh, on the phone state. So, each phone. Uh, is split into three states, uh, beginning, uh, middle, and in the, and a hand. And so you have transitions uh, between these four states that are back of, that form a Markov chain. And from this Markov chain, you have an emission. So here you have one that is shown for uh, the uh, first state of the form A. And the emission is a mixture of Gaussians in the feature space that we have at the beginning. So that's how we train neural networks for like the past 20 years. Uh, sorry, uh, we, uh, we trained the uh, ASR model for the past 20 years. Okay, so when you do that, uh, you need to have time aligned uh, phonetic computation, and that will be true also for all the deep neural networks that we will see that will be supervised, fully supervised. And um, the, the fonts are divided into three states, as I said, but then also you do a lot more divisions uh, based, on the, based on the information that you have for the uh, context of the phones. So basically, you cluster them, for instance, three phones or uh, five phones. So you have much much bigger uh, uh, number of possible outputs. And then you have a, so you have a phone level longer. Yeah. What do you mean by phone? Uh, so a phone is a so okay. Maybe I should say phoneme. I would be wrong by saying phoneme, but I should say phoneme, and you you would understand. So a phoneme is a the abstract representation of sound and a phone is what is produced. Uh, the main difference is that uh, you can have uh, one phonemic annotation and that will not be what is produced in the sound, but that's that's basically the spelling in the acoustic domain. The, the basic part of the speech. Of the speech. Yeah, so for instance, if you do, uh, if you say uh, <coughs> uh, bab, for instance, you have a phoneme B and then a phoneme A and then a phoneme B. And that's the same for phones for this. Um, so yeah. Okay. So f now you can. I think you can without too much uh, making too much of an error. You can replace phone by phoneme, and, and you'll, you'll understand.
understand everything. Um, so you have a phone level language model, and then you have also a, what is called a world level language model uh, that will do, uh, that will weight uh, um, uh, speech recognition by what is uh, likely in the, world, in the world language model, of course. Okay, so the big change that happened in 2010 was um, to add, uh, to replace the GMM, so the GMM, so emission model here was a GMM, to replace it by the by a deep belief network, which was a, a popular type of uh, deep neural network at the, at the time that used pre-training and then fine-tuning. Uh, so this kind of model is, uh, you, you take the input here, so which is uh, the features, so the same features as we saw before, and uh, you propagate them uh, in the network for several either layers with so this is a matrix application, and then this is a non-linearity, and you do that several times, and at the end you do you apply a softmax, a softmax function that you have here, and that you use as a likelihood for for HMM. And basically, how you do that, you train an HMM GMM, and then you first align all the phone states from the data set that you had uh, the labels for, and then you cut off the GMM, you train the DBN, and you use the DBN as the emission model for the HMM. And that's how, we, how it was done until very recently, actually. Okay, so if you want to play with that also, I, I have some code that reproduces uh, this kind of results. Okay, so, yeah, to give you um, <coughs> more uh, numbers, maybe, uh, the architecture that was used at Google until uh, quite recently uh, was to do the kind of feature transformation that I showed you, and then train a deep neural net uh, without pre-training uh, with Six, uh, six layers, uh, two to four thousand uh, units per year, using dropout, which is a technique that uh, kind of regularizes uh, the network. Rectify in our units, which are uh, a type of nonlinearity, and uh, yeah, as I said, no protein. Then they had the HMM. Uh, they had the decision tree on top of the uh, of the phonemes to to decide uh, which context they should keep and which they should not. And then they did a, a recurrent neural net uh, language model uh, for the uh, for the world level. Okay, so it, it was it was started at Google uh, following this paper uh, and until very recently, as I said. But it was actually also uh, used at Microsoft and IBM and a lot of other big companies because it was working so well. Oh, actually, I, I should have put the results here. So. The best results that you could get with this was about um, so in speech recognition when you do the uh, when you look at the acoustic model you count in phone er phone error rate which is the number of errors that you do if you do the transcription at the phone level. So when you do HMM GMMs on the classic benchmark uh, for speech recognition which is Timit, uh, the best scores were about 27 percent of phone error rate. And when they moved to this architecture, they went down up to 22% of phone error rate, which is a huge, huge decrease in phone error rate. And so, uh, recently, uh, they, so everybody, um, uh, even the industry, uh, the industry started to move also to the LSTM. So instead of doing this uh, Frankenstein of uh, cutting the HMM GMM, they, uh, they replaced the sequence model by training uh, jointly the sequence part and the emission part by using uh, this kind of cells. So instead of having just uh, rectified linear units, you have a cell that is recurrent in time and that has some kind of internal memory that it can uh, uh, update. Uh, and in this in this uh, this way, they can uh, train both the sequence and the and the acoustic model. And if you look at the uh, at the results here, these are the results for this kind of models from. Uh, 2013, they went down to 17.7 uh, and the same timid uh, data set, which, is, uh, which was the state of the art for quite a long time. Uh, and still is by uh, almost, uh, it's still very close to the state of the art. And uh, that's what is being put in production in major uh, companies right now. Okay, and so, uh, so if you're interested in deep learning, I think. Some of you may have heard about this paper, which is uh, uh, which was published at NIPS this year, which was uh, do deep networks really need to be deep? 
uh, and these are their, so these are their uh, scores on TMIT. So these are shallow networks with just one hidden layer that get 20% of uh, funnel rate. But, uh, <coughs> so the point of this paper was that they first trained deep neural networks to do the fund uh, classification, and then they trained uh, a shallow neural net with uh, as many weights as the deep neural net um, to predict the likelihood of the fully trained uh, deep neural network, and not to predict the classes. And that's what make, made it work so well. And so they, uh, they achieved a pretty, pretty good course, even with a shallow neural net. So maybe depth is not uh, the... Excuse me, what's a timid uh, test? What was it, uh, what's the core test in timid? Sorry? The timid test, uh, what's, what, what's oh, the test uh, it's a It's a test, um, uh, it's a test set. So in timid, you have a standard train set, dev set, and test set. And this way, everybody uses this split of the data and everybody gets uh, comparable scores in the test set. But what kind of data is it? Oh, it's a, so it's a speech data set, as I, as I said. It's a, it's a very classical speech data set uh, that's not very long. It's four hours in off, in, in, um, so four, four hours, and you have about three hours for the training. So it's not that long. Uh, like, if you look at the data set that they use in the industry, they use uh, at Google, they have about 2,000 hours that are annotated at the phone level. So every millisecond is annotated for which phone uh, is, is being sent. Um, so, yeah, it's not that large, but it's very well recorded and it covers, uh, it covers a lot of uh, the phonemic vi uh, viability of English. And it was funded by uh, DARPA in 1989. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, it's a classic uh, budget. Yes, in the LSTM, I didn't uh, get. Uh, do they get rid of? You get rid of the H HMM at all? Uh, yeah, they yeah. they get totally rid of the HMM. Yeah. Uh, here, that's a score with uh, just LSTM units. Four, if I remember correctly, that's the four level of LSTM units. Yes. So four layers uh, that act on the same input that I showed at the beginning. Three. Three so. Yeah, I think I think it's yeah three hidden, but uh, you have an input one. That's also an LSTM. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's it. So the, the HMMs are not, not even anymore in production in this. Uh, Sorry. The HMMs are, are just gone. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they are gone everywhere yeah. because it's actually it's actually kind of a pain to have a good implementation and a fast uh, implementation of LSTM. But I know that at Google they have one and maybe at Microsoft also. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not, uh, the benefits are like, uh, based on the best HMM uh, deep neural net, it's maybe 2% of funnel rate, yeah. uh, but that's on TMIT. So then if you work on a, a large scale data set, it's maybe less evident. And then if you look at all the, if you look at the word error rate after that, that uses the word language model, it's less, less evident that uh, uh, this difference in phone error rate is really beneficial. So this is the phone error rate? Yeah, phone error rate, P-E-R, phone error rate. Word error rate is W-E-R. Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> this was all for um, supervised learning uh, setting. So I just gave you an overview. If you want to know more about the detail, I think you, you should go and read these papers. They are actually pretty easy to, to follow. Um, and so now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what I'm interested in. Uh, on the totally also, so I, I would like to train acoustic models, but with, uh, with data that is uh, readily accessible to infants when they learn the language. And is that, that's totally, um, uh, we, we cannot assume that they have access to phone aligned data sets. Uh, so phone time aligned data set. So basically, uh, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you can say we, are, we can try to do phonetic clustering, and that doesn't work at all. So this is the a classic picture that, uh, that illustrates that. Uh, even if you put uh, these phonemes, so these are not all the, all the phonemes of English, just some of them, and just some realizations of them, uh, in the first and second format, which are classical um, uh, speech dimensions, uh, to look at the data, uh, it's very hard to cluster. I mean, here we can draw the Gaussians, but just because we know the assignment. Okay, so <coughs> my work consists of doing a um, weekly supervised uh, acoustic learning. So we need some 
annotations. We need some uh, information about what we are going to try and separate because as we saw just with previous slide, if we try to do pure clustering, pure, pure unsupervised learning, it's not going to work. Um, so we want to learn an acoustic model that's uh, as good as uh, time aligned phonetic subscriptions, but without using them. Um, so what we know by looking at uh, babies is that when they know the, the lexicon, so when they know which word are being spoken by adults, uh, they are much, uh, much better at, um, at uh, inferring the phoneme categories. So there, are, there have been tests uh, about that in uh, psycholinguistics. So we, we, we are going to do a model that tries to learn uh, phone level um, acoustic modeling by just using a word level annotation. So it just knows about the words that are being said and not, uh, not the phonemes and not which phonemes are in, in which words. So to do that, uh, we, take, uh, we take the timid uh, data set, we take the, the word like that. So this is worth welfare. So this is in the, uh, in the dimension of the features, so the 40 filter banks. And uh, in the x-axis, you have the time. This is welfare said by uh, one speaker on the left and another speaker on the right. And we do a dynamic time warping of uh, both of these and we get this alignment that you have at the bottom. So what we will use is we will say, if, if you know that this is the same word, you just have to know that this is the same word, along the path of the dynamic time warping, uh, that should represent the same, uh, the same speech. And uh, if we take two different words and we can align them, for instance, by a diagonal, uh, that should represent a different speech. So sometimes you are going to, to be wrong because sometimes uh, there will be a phonetic variation for the same word and sometimes we are also going to be wrong because if we align two different words they may have the same uh, phonetics at some point but statistically we are going to be right. Okay, so we are going to train a deep neural net that, that takes the uh, speech here as input, so as this uh, 40 filter box that we stack. Okay, I didn't say that before, but everybody <laughs> stacks a filter box because basically you don't want to just decode one frame, you want to have some context to have a, to model for the covariations of, uh, of speech. You don't want to just work with uh, 25 milliseconds. So here we work with uh, 7 times 10 uh, milliseconds, um, which is not a lot actually. And then so we, we put that in a, in a deep neural net. We share, uh, we share all the weights for the, for the net. And we put the bit from the first word. So for instance, from the word on the left here, on the left here. And we put, oh sorry, and we put uh, the bits from the word on the right. So the, the y axis of the word on the right that we um, put to the dynamic term mapping, we put them uh, on the right here. And then we compute their fit forward through the network and we compute the distance. And what we are going to say is that uh, when they have parts of the same word, the distance should be small or the similarity should be high. And when they are from different worlds, the distance should be big or the similarity should be low. And uh, how, how, how do we do that? We design a loss function that does exactly that. So the cost that we will use, uh, so basically when you do um, fully supervised neural networks, uh, very often you use a softmax. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time you use a softmax at the output. So the loss is a logistic loss. Here the loss is going to be this cost. Uh, 1 minus the cosine similarity for the output representation if they are the same, or the cos squared similarity if they are different. So what you will do is that when uh, two words are the same, they should be collinear in the output space that we will call actually also the embedding space. And when they are different, uh, they should be orthogonal in the output space. Okay, so these were uh, prior works on this kind of architecture, but not applied to speech. And so, so we train this, okay, so these are just technicalities, but we train this on Timit. Uh, these are the um, uh, similarities for the pairs of same word and the pairs of different word on the validation set and the train set. And in the X you have the epoch of the training.
the surface of a sphere? Uh, no, so uh, the vectors are not on the surface of the sphere, but actually, if you are in a very high dimension, it's very easy to be orthogonal. It's very high to be collinear. Because if you have, for instance, we use 100, so as a, I didn't detail it, but here we use 100 as a onto space. Uh, if you want to be collinear, you have to be collinear on 100 di dimensions. Uh, and if you want to be orthogonal, you have to be orthogonal on just one of these 100. So that's why we use this last function. Uh, please, I have another question on the previous slide. Yes? What does the NF and NH in okay, so, okay, I didn't want to go into the detail too much, but, okay, so NH is number of hidden units, and F is number of frames, and NE is number of uh, the embedding. So NE is the output, uh, the dimension of the embeddings that we use, and uh, NH is the dimension of the hidden units that we use, and NF is number of frames. Okay, so, so we tried that, we showed that according to the last function it trained well and it didn't overfit. So now we need a, a way to evaluate what is trained in this uh, representation. So to do that uh, with a fine grain, um, we use the ABX paradigm, which is we present you with the A, with the B, and then with the X, and we ask you if X is A or B. And if you say that it's B and it was A, you're wrong. And if you say it's B and it was B, you're right. And you do that for a lot of pairs. Uh, actually, for three minutes. And so if we do that, we can do that on the phonemes like that. So we put them in the same triform context. And we change just the middle phoneme. And we show A and B from the same talker and X from a different talker. And so we just count every time that the model is right on this and wrong otherwise. And we can do that for, um, so we can do that for the speech features that we have as input. We can do that also for the supervised models that I showed you before, uh, and we can do that for all models. So that's the error rate according to this score. Uh, if you do that for the features, you're about uh, at about 20% of error rate uh, by looking at the discriminativity for the faults across the talker. Uh, if you do that on the far right for the H, so HGK posteriograms, it's for HMM GMMs, so it's the best uh, HMM GMMs uh, that you can get. You will get about 12% uh, of uh, phonal rate. I think 11, uh, sorry, of ABX uh, rate. I think it's 11 actually. Uh, if you do that for, um, so we do also a deep neural net that is trained fully supervised. Uh, and that is much for the capacity of our neural net, so, so that is not, uh, it does not have access to more uh, capacity, more weight. Uh, in this case, you are at above, uh, I think, 8.5% uh, of error rate. And um, the orange uh, part is our model, uh, which is at about 12% of error rate. So basically, uh, by knowing this score, uh, we, sh we we show exactly what is the discriminability between phonemes of these models, and we are at uh, four fifths of the improvement between the, the speech features that are already good for discriminating uh, speech to the supervised models that are trained fully supervised by having <coughs> access to the phonemes. Okay, okay. So this is just a detail of uh, of all the scores. Um, Okay, so so just so this is just a qualitative ex, uh, expli explanation of what we train in the network. So if we look at the filter banks, these are the speech features here, and uh, on the on the x-axis here you have the phonemes. Um, basically, if you look at the speech features, you can discriminate between uh, the consonants, the vowels, and the nasals. Uh, the nasals are in uh, yellow, uh, yellow on the top, not on the activations, right? Um, the vowels are in uh, in red, and uh, the consonants are in blue, green, and uh, I think that's all. Uh, blue, green, and, uh, and uh, vi violet. Okay, and if we plot that in uh, all representation by doing also by clustering, we have much finer grained clusters. We can differentiate between more type of um, uh, of uh, phonemes. Uh, yeah, and basically that's uh, what this shows. We have much more uh, sparse representations. 
Okay, so this is just a summary uh, of this work. Uh, we have 11.8 ABX error rate, 9.2 for the best provides, and 19.5 uh, for the raw features. Um, so we were not really interested in doing that for having uh, uh, the best acoustic models, but for tr trying to see if we can learn without having access to the uh, phone level annotation. Uh, but actually that could also be a good acoustic model for language that don't have that much uh, data that is annotated at the phonemic level. So because English and French, for instance, are uh, well resourced uh, data sets, uh, a language with a lot of data sets, but uh, if you look at uh, languages that are less spoken uh, in the world, it's, it's an efficient way to train an acoustic model. Okay, I think I'm, I'm done. Okay, so I I did not yet because it's still um, it's still a deep neural net, so it still, still takes quite some time to train. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, the model I showed you it takes two days on the timid, which is four hours. I mean, I use three hours because I use a train set. Um, and when you use larger data set, if you do the approach uh, kind of bluntly as I do, you the data set square uh, is squared, so so it makes them very large. Uh, but actually, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of doing that. Actually, I, I already trained other models um, and that are kind of like that. Instead of training uh, just for the words, they train for the same or different words and for the same or different talker. I just had the result for this uh, this week, so I didn't discuss them here yet. Um, but yeah, I'm training that on larger data set, like 20 hours, but that's still not that large. We have access now to larger and larger data sets. So, um, <coughs> of course, I'm interested in doing that. It just takes time. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> have you tried to increase the depth of the models and maybe uh, like the same number of parameters with, with uh, Okay, so yes, I tried to I tried a lot of architectures. Um, so actually, the ones that I've shown in my papers have four layers of depth. Um, you have returns, but diminution diminution returns with more layers. Uh, that's not exactly a bijection for as for the supervised models, but if we look for the supervised models, I think uh, where is it? I have the plot that shows for yeah. So, for instance, this is a kind of diminution returns that you would get. It's a, it's a score here, and in the y-axis is the phonon rate, and in the x-axis you have the number of layers. Uh, so this is from the from one of the seminal papers on uh, deep learning for spectral condition. So you have some return, but it's really diminishing as long as you get more and more layers, and it's more and more expensive to train. So at some point you you get them. Yeah.